All right, I think uh, we'll get started. We're just waiting for the uh, audio visual support person to come in. In the meanwhile, there's no problem. We can, the first um, slide that I had generally is, is more of a discussion um, and things. So I think yesterday, so I think by now, we, I'm, I'm the Panshu, I'm deep. Uh, we, we met yesterday, I think briefly for, uh, for a while and uh, I think you had your session in the in the evening giving you uh, an introduction to what you would consider as the social uh, stratification or the social class um, feature of the Indian society. Uh, what do you understand by the caste system? Uh, what or how many <coughs> different variations of caste systems evolve? Uh, a lot of that was, I think, brought in. It's a very complex dimension. I think the idea was to give you a certain sense of how uh, layered, complicated uh, the societal system has become as against to what it was envisaged. Uh, of course, you would see that social hierarchies are in every country, in every nation state. Uh, it's not as if that hierarchies are not, not, not in, in any special part is just that in the South Asian region, the way a lot of behavior and culture is, is, is formulated is done in a very non-legal manner. Behavior is not only shaped from uh, our perspective of what we consider as. So if you see that uh, in most societies that we consider today as industrially developed societies, Law plays a very important role in a lot of things in terms of exploring behavior, um, limiting or defining what liberty or freedom would mean and entail. In the Indian context, you'd largely realize that a, we're not a very uh, law-driven uh, society. A lot of emphasis is driven on social customs, cultural behavior and networks, and that's something which uh, is everything all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are we concerned about the person who's not here? No, no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so the oh, all right. We've got this set up. So I thought I think maybe it's good to take a step forward from yesterday and give you a little bit idea about how uh, India's economic landscape looks like. And it's, a, it's again, it's a daunting exercise to try giving an idea between independent India, 1947 to almost 2019. Uh, it's a long period of time and it's, it's difficult to kind of keep going back and forth. What, what I've tried to uh, highlight are two aspects. One is what are uh, some of the major challenges that the Indian uh, economy is facing, and this is connected with two aspects. One is of the business landscape, also with terms of how we have directed policies which have not really yielded, in some cases, the desired set of outcomes. In some cases, it has worked reasonably well, right? So I'll give a kind of a picture on that. The other aspect is to start by a discussion <laughs> on talking about the process of how we account for growth, right? And, and you, would, you would be familiar as students from uh, business school that a lot of emphasis in literature is often given that if you're growing at a certain rate in an economy, it's good for you to, to develop, right? But at the same time, what we constitute as important for growth, which is more on production, how much you are producing as a nation, how, uh, how much of your land, labor, capital, entrepreneur technology, most of these factors are contributing to the productivity is something that you account for growth diagnoses. Uh, but in your state of development, there's always a dichotomy in terms of what you constitute as development. You say that I have more income and that makes us uh, a little bit more well off and happy. Or is it that there are other things that you find more reason to value? And I think that's something which, which needs to be made very clear in terms of understanding. In the Indian context, a lot of val value 
is given to the idea of development which goes beyond income accumulation right when i say income accumulation we're not just happy getting more income we need more right and more in terms of not what you would consider as quantifiable variables there's some what you would call as uh, seeing economic development as a function of some mediated social arrangements that's why i've just tried to put it in a simple equation of sorts that our idea generally in the south asian context i would say south asia because if you look at the history broadly india's uh, nature and approach as a uh, see it was a, it was a, it was a thousand kingdoms that were in power when you had in the pre british or pre mughal era right so india bangladesh sorry No, that's fine. Okay, I, I, I'll see. I'll pause at different points, but I think uh, let, that's fine. Even if your history uh, is limited, the idea for the Indian concept of development is to not see. Um, so the idea of India's uh, development is not to see itself only in terms of us producing more goods and services. Yes, of course, that's important, but. we uh, uh, have tried to look at mediating growth with different social arrangements and i think there there are certain challenges that are there at the same time i think our idea of looking at uh, growth mediated arrangements are uh, could be bifurcated into five aspects right uh, one is to be able to in, let people uh, have a certain degree and this is very much the first point is interest, interestingly linked a lot with our constitutional drafting our own constitution allows for citizens and the idea of citizenship to enjoy basic civic freedoms right um it's just not about the right to vote but also participate in the decision making process uh, holding people accountable a number of those things that you consider as very important as a part of a democratic structure um uh, political freedoms the way you would see is as a part of a very inclusive idea there's no uh, uh, race uh, creed that you would see is excluded from this process in fact that's something which the constitutional drafters paid a lot of attention to the second is aspects around economic facilities so you could see these as five instrumental freedoms that we consider as most valuable in our uh, idea of substantive development right uh does that mean that we've achieved all five i think that's a that's the mismatch in some cases at some periods of time we've done well in one or maximizing one but in some cases we've not done well in trying to look at the other right so that's something which is for you to to look at in which area and which aspect there is a certain problem so uh, the first thing is of being able to look at civic freedoms and rights the second is that of economic facilities uh um, economic facilities largely means access to the market if you want to do business right regardless of your own social uh structure and position you should have access to the market both to buy and sell goods and services in fact in despite the discriminatory lens that caste class and gender uh functions you would see that most people in their own uh societal constructs have tried to to set up market spaces in fact when you go to delhi uh, to place in the in the market of connaught place you will see everyone who has with the least amount of resources has found a way to do business someone is cleaning shoes someone is giving you apparel someone is giving selling posters on the street they don't have a shop but everyone is so there is a natural instinctive entrepreneurial uh, basis of reasoning and i think that's very important to see uh the third is looking around social opportunities i think this is where we've done uh not so well uh if i would be very uh, polite about the way social opportunities would mean access to healthcare education housing those what you consider as basic social or public goods that has been a big challenge in independent india in the last 60 70 years not everyone can boast of across states that they have access to basic healthcare basic education a lot has been done of course it's a nation of 1.3 billion people so there's always uh, a consideration but it's a it's a nation of 1.3 billion uh, because uh, uh, you didn't really put birth uh, 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 
processes in check as well. We, we are, I think just today there was a report that came out from the UN that we, our population growth rate has been the highest in average as compared to any other country, including China. So that's been a problem. Why is that a problem? And this is connected with our understanding that the three centuries uh, uh, that exist in the Indian landscape. One is the 18th, oh sorry, one is the 19th century. So you would see in the business and the way of doing business, some people using some ancient tools. Uh, you can look at carpentry, you can look at a blacksmith, like just basic uh, uh, ways of understanding. You could also see a 20th century evidence of factory and textiles doing those which evolved around the 20th century. And you, at the same time, you have the 21st century technology-based digital economy booming. So all three business models are coexisting at this point of time in the Indian landscape. Um, the last two points, which is of transparency and this, I think a lot has been done in this regard. One of the landmarks legislations that has come in India is called the Right to Information Act, which allows uh, citizens to get information on all public appointments, decisions of the government, and it gives citizens a bit more of a, or in other words, the civil society, a very higher sense of uh, participation. The final being of protective security. Now, what would this mean? Um, a goal of protective security largely means that we acknowledge that there are some vulnerable groups in every society, and a lot needs to be done for upward mobility of these groups. So I think uh, Vajad yesterday mentioned that a lot of the caste-based groups that have been historically discriminated have received some kind of reservation in government appointments, in schooling, in education. And the idea of reservation evolved in giving protection to allow for upward mobility. It's like this. Not all of us are born from the same, same household in the same set of conditions. Everyone is coming at a different level. To make sure that the, the line is most fair to people at different points of time, uh, you need certain protective measures. So, if we would say that what would development mean as an idea, I think it's an aggregate of these five, not a one. You just don't need market access and great business opportunities. You need to combine that with a number of the other things. So this is on growth diagnoses, and I think this is going to give you a good idea on which areas we've done reasonably well and which areas we've not done that well. Now, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, economic facilities, the way very simply it means is access to market. Access to market. I mean, um, a market is a place which provides a freer exchange between two strange groups, consumers and producers. And uh, regardless of where you are or which position you enjoy in the society, uh, does everyone have access to the market to either consume or to produce? That's the kind of economic freedom that one is uh, talking about. You mean about. by private people or by companies? Well, it doesn't matter. It's like this. If we are, a, we are a nation state, imagine if this cohort here is a nation state, doesn't matter where you or me are coming from or where we're born, we all have space to a market setting where we can go to consume or you can go to sell and I can go to sell as well. That's more on economic freedom. Right? Uh, nobody is, is, is constrained. There's, no, there's not much of restriction. There can be restriction on the point, and that's where restriction, restriction comes, that you can't go to that market, but if you go to this market, because maybe your affordability is there for this and that. And that's why you will see, interestingly, all market spaces across cities particularly cater to different groups of consumers and producers. Maybe in a certain market you would not want to go because you'd say that this is too crowded. I'll show some pictures so that it'll give you an idea. So I'll come to this. The reason why I'm bringing this out is this is a broader framework which can help you understand. And then we go to what you would consider as an eyes to ears approach. So what I'll try to do is give you a perspective which is a macro perspective, right? A very bird's eye view. And it's, that's why you would eyes there so that where 
from the plain what you can see. But at the same time, what are the ears telling you as well in the sense when you go right on the, on the field, what kind of a perspective do you capture, right? Um, so in doing so, uh, we'll start first with the macro approach and I'll just talk here about, uh, of course this presentation would be shared and you'll have access to this for your own reference. I will go on a few points a little quickly because we have to be aware a little bit of time as well. So what I'll do is I'll try covering some of uh, most of the major points, but the charts and the data is already there. So the first, uh, uh, the main question we're looking at are, what are the main challenges that uh, the Indian economy faces today? And none of these challenges can be said that, okay, this is something which has happened in the last two years or three years. It's a doing of the last good 40, 50 years of uh, our policy exercise. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, there's six of them. Um, I, would, I would probably lay them out all from you at the, first, at the first time. The first you could see is a, a, a challenge on between sectors. So in other words, you would, as, as very one-on-one -on -one understanding of basic economics or business, you would say that you want to develop your industries at different stages. The primary sector, the secondary sector, and what you call as the tertiary sector. Primary sector would means develop your agriculture, get involve your farmers, then develop your factories, and then develop your banks. And at the same time, once all of these three are there, each of them are acting as you know interlinkages between each other. What we have done is there is a huge mismatch between how the agricultural sector is doing, how the manufacturer sector is doing, and how the services are doing. We've done very well in services, manufacturing not so well, and we've done terribly in agriculture. I'll, I'll, I've said, I'll just say, use the word terrible, but even that's an understatement because there was a potential of doing way more. Um, a lot of data would tell you that India, China, South Korea, number of these countries were at the same position in agricultural productivity in early 1980s. Right, China doubled its agricultural productivity in less than seven years. Right, uh, South Korea doubled it in less than 15 years. And we have still remained at the same level of productivity. In fact, our productivity has reduced from what it was in the early 80s. We'll come to some of these points. Second is the issue with the banking sector. This is a recent phenomena. Our banking sector right now, particularly in the financial landscape, is quite stressed. When you use the word stressed, that means there's a high amount of debt that the bank is accumulating in terms of what you'd call as bad loans or not performing assets. And that's restricting the bank's freedom to provide more credit, right? And that's something which we'll, we'll discuss. The third is of employment. Employment is a big constraint. I think that's a lot being discussed in the elections right now. Uh, it's, it's, it's usually not a big issue otherwise because a lot of people talk about poverty, income as one. This is an election which has discussed employment a lot. The fourth is gender, and I think that's a very important aspect to look at because you have to understand that what's true of the male labor force participation is not true of the female labor force. I, I mentioned this yesterday that you should look at, in your own time on campus, uh, the constitution of workforce in terms of the gender and look at the tasks they're all doing, right? Look at gardeners, look at those in the catering team, and also those who are coming and talking to you in, in terms of interaction. Last two points, I think, on inequities in nourishment and low government expenditure uh, are those where I put the data, but we can, we can kind of uh, look at this. Let, let me start with challenge one uh, in terms of the gap between these three sectors. Um, all right, this is, this, is, this is a chart which just gives you an idea of the distribution of the workforce. So most of the data you'd see is post-2000 to give you an idea about the latest figures uh, in the last two decades or so. Uh, in the distribution of the workforce, you will find that between the period of 2000 and 2013, 2013 is when the last kind of national census report was brought out, we still know that mo around 50% of our aggregate population is working in the agricultural sector. Around 21 to 22% of people are working in industries, right? 
and around 28% or 29% are working <coughs> in services. But what you would see is that each of these sectors are disproportionately contributing to overall income. That's your overall growth, what you consider as, I think most of you would know GDP as it's a, it's a very simple measure. It's gross domestic product. Um, so income, you know, you, you growth is, Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, 50 percent of the people, so if there are 100 people in a country, 50, per, 50 of them are working in agriculture. You would see this, I mean you will have a visit today, you will get a very good understanding of how much of importance is agriculture. But the numbers change in two cases and that is why I am going to kind of walk you through a different set of numbers. One is, where is our income coming from, right and that is a question a lot of people ask. Your people are mostly working in uh, agriculture, but most of your income is coming from services and that is why uh, we focus a lot in our policies towards services because that is where your money is coming from and not so much in agriculture because it's a, well, most people are employed there, but it is not giving us that much of productivity in terms of performance. Why you say that? Between 2012 and 2015, you see that our contribution of services was the most Industry has started reasonably doing slightly better, but this is abysmal or very weak for a country that big, that your industries are not self-sufficient to that level. Um, there are some businesses which have done well. I would say one of the best cases you can think of is perishable products. What you consider as perishable is, you know, milk and uh, dairy products or vegetables. It is a miracle how we are able to produce in spite of the structural challenges as much that the people want to consume. You know milk is one of the biggest examples and it is all in the rural networks of cooperatives that it started becoming popular. So a classic example you can think of, we did not have the time and you can write it probably, you can look at it as Amul, A-M-U-L. It is a cooperative that started in Gujarat and became a nationwide uh, milk uh, consumption. Amul is A M U L, yeah. This is, 
this is composition of GDP. If your if your growth level is at five percent, let's say in two thousand and twelve, how much of that contribution is coming from revenue earned from services? How much of that is coming from industry, and how much of that is coming from agriculture? That's inside. GDP is inside. always inside. It's okay. domestic product. GNP, which is another indicator, gross national product, okay. looks at income earned by. So, if I'm an Indian working in Israel, and I'm earning income, and, and, and I'm an Indian citizen, that would be a part of calculation in gross national product. Okay. But Indians earning in India. No, so export is a different calculation. I'll come to exports so separately. Have, so do you have a large uh, quantity of, uh, of uh, agricultural exports? Agriculture exports? Exports, I'll show the data in, in a while. Just right now we're trying to look at, okay, where is your income coming from and how many people are working there? So I'll take it step by step. Okay. We're trying to kind of incrementally go so that you're not kind of given all information at the same time. Okay. Let's look at rural and urban areas. And this is going to give you a picture because you are fortunately at a point in the university campus which is located, which is more in the heart of the rural belt. So you would see this that all around the campus you find mostly farm areas. Now it's a very different space, but still most land is used for farming. That means what? If you look on the left side of the chart, that's 93, 2009, 2011, rural areas, the, the circuit portion, most income is coming from agriculture, right? So most, of course, most people are working in agricultural farmers, so they're earning most income from there. Very few are working in services, very few are adding to industry. But in the urban areas, that means when you go to Delhi, right, or when you go to Bangalore, when you go to Pune, when you go to Bombay, all these cities, you will find it's a complete reversal. Of course, these cities are not having <coughs> farming, as the main state. And that's why the policies are not made in rural areas, they're made in urban areas. So they're catering a lot to the urban group, which is doing better in services, right? Uh, and contributing more to income. I think this is a divide you can't afford to ignore. Because when you see here, you find most people are talking about how agricultural contribution is so high, and it's not given the same set of importance towards policies for incentives, particularly incentives as against the other. Well, by the way, I mean one of the ways of understanding is that the government's point has been agricultural income is not taxed in India, so all other income is, and the idea is that we're not going to tax you because you have a lower performance level, but that's not really help with productivity over time. I'll, I'll, I'll come to the performance level. I think this is just on agriculture itself, which tells you in the last four or five years, five years almost, the performance of agricultural growth has even dipped down. So it's like this, you're performing at a capacity of 20% and even that has come down to, 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 to 5% or so. What it needs to say is that uh, things are a, a problem, farmers are more distressed. Almost, I think the, the, the increase, increase has been documented by increase in farmer suicides. Uh, across India, I think this is it's. I think it's a country which, from what I understand, uh, given the stage of development we are, has the highest number of farmer suicides any country has in the world, and that's a big, big concern because farmers have found themselves to be trapped in a situation where they don't get the right set of incentives. They are indebted, they owe loans, and they're not able to get out, and that's a big problem because you consider a group of people as not entrepreneurs, but you consider them as you know social providers of food. I think that's the difference in the way the state has treated them. Now let's come to exports, and this is something which is important primarily from two areas. Our agri-business exports are all very ne negligible, to be honest, because we're not producing enough at the national level. Manufacturing, on the other hand, has a mixed story. There was a period of time that manufacturing exports as a percentage of overall GDP. So if our income is 100, uh, out of that 11% of uh, the, the income was spent on manufacturing exports. Uh, but that has again come down in the last four or five years. We've, 
we have been finding it very difficult to find partners who we can export much to. Now, what it means is it's not as if that this is for all sectors. Manufacturing, that's the story. Um, the, the current government, and when it came in power, uh, launched a scheme called as Make in India plan, which was to incentivize people to come in <coughs> India, manufacture for exports. This is very much similar to the South Korean or the Taiwanese model that they adopted in the East Asian economies in the 1960s. Um, but it didn't work that well because the number of institutional arrangements that made exportables a problem. Um, okay. All well? All right. Okay. I, I, I thought it was a reaction to the <laughs> export. I was like, okay, that's a very emotional response. Okay. Okay, so now one would say that, okay, why are your exports falling? Um, it did start picking up in 2015 and 16. Um, manufacturing exports in textiles were doing reasonably well, but our performance in growth of manufacturing sector started dipping down from 16 onwards. 2016, that means the last three years. So if you see from 2016, even your exports have started falling. These are correlative. So as we are not contributing enough, to manufacturing growth, our export levels are also falling. And that's why a lot of the trade partnerships within South Asia, India with Nepal, India with Bhutan, India with Sri Lanka, most of these countries that has been uh, a concern. So now you would see the Prime Minister making a lot of outreach in other regions, Europe, North America, Southeast Asia, Africa. But you know, it's like this, if, my, if your neighbors don't want something from you, very difficult that someone from a different land is going to come on the way. So, what yeah. Are the main, uh, Exports. Yeah. Uh, well, to, we've we've had hardly had mostly for textiles because manufacturing sector has been that. But the two other areas has been in automobile. In automobile, we've done very well in the 90s. But automobile, not in manufacturing of direct cars, but automobile parts. Uh, we've done also well in hardware segments. So I'm using the word we is because of the Indian context. Otherwise, I'd usually say India has done well and the distance one. But, but it's, I think the idea is that manufacturing exports have done well for a period of time, but they have been bottlenecks. Most manufacturing peop, uh, exporters would tell you that they are taking extra efforts to go to China, for example, to learn how China is doing more exporting. And it can be documented very interestingly between the partnership, a lot of people in Calcutta. You know Calcutta as a city, right? Uh, Calcutta, a lot of Calcutta traders, yeah, traders would travel to China. There's a small city called Kunming. Uh, and there's a flight between Kunming and uh, Calcutta, which is one, one and a half hours. It's very close by. And it's very interesting, in the flight, almost 80% of the people traveling, most flights are traders. And these are traders of apparel, clothes, right? And they're going to China to kind of uh, take most of the materials. But the idea is that there is no trade agreement that allows and facilitate for these networks. These are all informalized or unorganized ways. It's like I'm making an effort to go and come to Israel, but within India and Israel partnership, there's no formal association, right? If that's the situation, it makes things uh, to be worse off. So our standard of living in terms of income in the urban spaces has become higher because of a service class base. That's why. So you see, because of our services doing well, banking, I'll, I'll, I can give you an idea, banking, telecom, shipping, uh, mostly financial services that you would see, uh, IT, which is the biggest uh, segment, information technology. That's where most income and standard of living has really increased, right? Even 10 to 20 times. Uh, but in case of manufacturing, I think that's been a, a, a constraint. I think the only segment I feel we've done really well there is a segment called fast moving consumer goods, FMCG. It's for, okay, when you're buying water, uh, at this very for example that you're seeing, mm -hmm. you can buy um, toothpaste, coffee, all of these are fast moving goods. And in that, there has been a lot that has been done. 
right? But they are not, um, you know, their ability to export much is very limited. It's mostly for domestic consumption, right? Um, but uh, yeah. Both, both. Actually, they they they're working. See, it's like this: the Chinese state is very protective of who is coming and who is going out. So it's not it's not possible for you to go and spend, let's say, six months studying the markets. What you do is you go with some goods, and from there you would start understanding that how. But only the rich traders are only the rich traders are going to China, or all of them. Oh, rich? No, no, no. These are small and medium scale traders. Medium. I would say medium because they can afford the flight ticket. Yes. Right? They can afford the flight. And it's not too expensive. That's why I said Calcutta, Kunming. That's a network you can see. Uh, we saw it when, I mean, we were traveling to Yunnan province. And in the flight, I saw almost 70 to 80 percent people, all traders, they were discussing trade. And that made, you know, a few of us very curious. Okay, why are you going there? This is on average, we are going twice a month and we're going with a basket of goods like apparel, but there is no comparison because just we're looking at the sheer scale of production there and there's no comparison, but that's something we need to do back in Calcutta, for example. Most traders would say there's no much to learn from that scale of production we can do because medium scale traders are getting a lot of. So manufacturing, there is again a lot of potential, but there has been Future channel challenges. I think services, if you would see, this is the last 10 to, to, to 15 years of data. We've done really well in services. In fact, only thing that you need to see is the blue line. And uh, there was a time between 2007 and 9, and I'll let you guess. Why do you think that services exports came down? Any idea? If you see between 2007 and 2009 or 10, that time, all of a sudden, there was a dip. The financial yeah, crisis, yeah. right? And that, that yeah. brought us really, kind of pulled us down. What kind of services? IT, finance, telecom. Um, what? No, these are the ba major things. Banking within finance. Um, within IT, you could look at, uh, uh, you know, constituents of digital economy where you're trying to do of software development. Mm -hmm. Uh, in computer manufacturing, for example, within that and providing uh, <coughs> support, uh, even medical. I mean, India is the only country which enjoys a trade surplus with the U.S. Not because we are exporting a lot of goods, but we export a lot of people who are very highly skilled, right? So doctors, engineers, and that was the USP of the United States from the 1970s. U.S. has been the one of the only countries in the world to attract the best talent from all over. Why? Because they give you a very high amount of wages and revenue. And they said, listen, if you come and be a part of the American dream, uh, the, the dream would be realized by you coming. So I think that uh, H, uh, uh, what, what is the visa? It's uh, H1B. H1B, H1B. 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 I, I keep, because we're doing work on agriculture, so I, I keep seeing H1B, it's in the seeds. Right, so H1B. <laughs> That's why I caution myself. We know that in Canada, in Canada University, I think that uh, except for the Americans, the majority of the foreign uh, lecturers, professors, are Indians and Israelis. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so yeah. So I mean, I think on education, it's untapped. We'll come to. The, I mean, the point is, education is something where people have gone and invested in themselves. And they feel, listen, let me go in the U.S. There's no value for talent for me here. So it's better for me that I go and spend more time teaching in the U.S. because I'm going to get a little more money. And the idea is tomorrow if I write a paper and I'm publishing it, uh, it's me getting the credits vis-a-vis -vis the institute I'm working for. That's a big problem with uh, intellectual property rights as well. But let me just move on with that. So why do you think exports is not doing well? And that's a question which a lot of people ask. I think it's a function of two things that manufacturing sector generally is not done well in India and this is where we have lagged behind China as a country because I, 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 com I do not compare between these two countries, they are completely diverse but both had the same challenges. They had the same challenge in having a weak agricultural sector, a weak manufacturing sector till early 80s. I think they just focus on these two in two decades, right? 
manufacturing growth picked up and as a result of that but a lot of people say that okay for manufacturing to go up my product should cost very competitive in the international market a chinese uh, bottle would cost let's say 5 rupees i should sell this the same thing at, at 3 rupees right if i need to stand a chance to compete and that requires what currency reform your currency should be cheap enough right and i think that's again you come you see some some of the data that our currency has been kept overvalued uh, the reason for doing that was completely different the central bank of the country wanted not to keep the currency too cheap and buy too much capital but what it has done is our export competitiveness has been affected bangladesh another country in the south asian region um, so i would say in the last 4 years if you really look at data on china's exports in the world china's exports in manufacturing has come down in fact they've not been doing that well and around 2014 and 15 that was a gap which was very clear in the south asian and southeast asian region two countries can you guess which ones filled that gap in increasing their manufacturing exports vietnam yeah okay let the uh, let the students also yeah, yeah the question is the question is the china's exports started dropping around 2013 14 uh in manufacturing and textiles as a result of that there were two countries from south asia and southeast asia that filled the gap by increasing their exportable levels russia no not russia india maybe no philippines no 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 not japan no so one of the countries has been mentioned already vietnam vietnam yeah definitely it was vietnam which got it and vietnam was not doing very interesting you'll see vietnam has not done it only for increasing manufacturing for its own country it has procured a lot of raw materials in textiles from cambodia and done manufacturing and uh, work in vietnam that's why the factories in vietnam procure 40 to 50% of the material we've done work in cambodia last 3 years so i've been observing how these industries work so vietnam is doing really well which is the other country that's in south asia uh, south asia south asia <coughs> south asia okay no that's bangladesh that's bangladesh is the other country it's tremendous textile manufacturing has picked up yeah <coughs> so both these countries uh, managed to increase manufacturing but they did it by keeping the currency values cheaper now i i'll just I'll just move on this so this is the valuation of the rupee if you see the valuation of the rupee between just 3 years for 3 years time january 2014 and november 2017 uh your value of the rupee vis-a-vis -vis other currencies is rising that means rupee is becoming stronger any strong currency means your products are going to cost more why would you buy indian products when you can buy something cheaper right unless and until you're selling something that people do not have so their only services is the area where we don't have substitutes so indian people are seeing okay you know they can work more hours give them a task they'll come back with this and you know they'll have their own ways around so on that regard of course but services the only trade off is what's the problem yeah the microphone no yeah it's not here i think it's not so the 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 only trade off with 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 services is any country which can train its people better in a short period of time and provide the services cheap of cost will substitute you and that's where two countries are doing really well now and they're competing very actively with india that's why most universities what are the two other asian students you see either indian or chinese right but chinese uh, have worked a lot in trying to train people to get certain skills that they can help out in services i think that's one but the other country which is receiving a lot of investment uh and investing in english education to train people to provide services is philippines that's the other country so a lot of our you know back end it uh bpos so if you would have a refrigerator problem you would call someone on a call number and that call would usually go to india uh, a lot of times in the us at least that was the case now those calls are not going to to, to bangalore per se but they're going to philippines it's happened to me when i try to fix something in my computer but yeah 
somewhere. India, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. India was receiving all of that. Yeah. It was for for most of the time Indians were a back end service providers, had cheap labor for providing. But those skills have changed. Now the second challenge, which is what I think is with the banking situation, I think this is important because tomorrow, for example, two lakhs persons coming in are people from finance and banking. And this is a very important subject right now because manufacturing sector not doing well means that you have to do something to give more credit to people, to give more incentives. And if your banking sector is uh, facing a little bit of a problem, I think that would make it issue, uh, issue a bigger one. How's that? Sorry. Yeah, 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 automation. Yeah. So, see, I mean, that's a, that's a, it's a very important point. Automation came to India in one industry in way back in mid 1990s, and that was in automobile. Uh, the Japanese uh, brought the technology in. Uh, manufacturing of cars, in other words, became almost all uh, completely automated. We were trying to see if you could go to an automation, uh, sorry, uh, an automobile plant. Uh, but I think this time it was not this possible. But I think in any visit that you have in the forthcoming years, uh, make sure you visit an automobile plant. You'd see that earlier, on an average, an automobile company plant would have 500 to at least 1,000 people, minimum employed. I think now the numbers have come down to less than 50. So the, lab it, the production has gone up because it's become more capital intensive through automation, but the labor's presence in those segments has really come down. That's happening now in retail. We see with Amazon uh, coming in with all markets, it's completely automating everything. And we've been, I think in the policy framework, if you see in India, they've been very skeptical on getting Amazon to completely automated because we are generally a labor surplus economy, right? So any technology that comes and is against labor uh, 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 involvement is counterproductive to the other challenge. When you see with employment, you see that's one of the major aspects. So on banking, I think the idea is very simple. Uh, we have banks which have, if you see just this chart itself, in the last five years or so, the red line will tell you that most of our banks are public sector banks. They have ownership from the government and participation, have seen a very high rate of bank debt. Non-performing assets means I've given you a loan, you failed to repay back the loan. I don't have the resources now to get money from somewhere else. This is on my balance sheet and it's more of a non-performing asset, no, no returns for me. And as a result of that, banks are becoming more and more reluctant to give more credit out to other people because they don't trust the borrowers that much. Private companies are finding it difficult and you know the worst effect of that is not felt by big businesses, right? So the big businesses yesterday, for example, with Raj was saying, uh, Ambani, Adani, all these people, they, they will find a way to, to get some capital because they have a big uh, uh, business landscape. The problem is with small and medium scale enterprises. So as a country which is a startup nation, right, you'd see that credit is most important at the initial stages, mm -hmm. the first three, four years. That's the, the, the main bottleneck we have. Banks do not have that much of trust to trust in an idea, that the idea will shape and, and, and work better. So as a result of that, we have seen that the credit growth levels, the blue line, uh, in the, the non-food sector, non-food sector is the data that is usually taken, has gone down. That means more and more people are finding it difficult to get loans. Banks are not trusting. I think that's a big 
constrained right now. Last <coughs> five years, this has become a major issue. Uh, I think before that, it wasn't that big an issue as against to what it has become now. I'll Can quick, I yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. My, my apologies. I <laughs> should have mentioned it. Uh, the word twin sheet. It's a. It's a. It's a term which is used in economics uh, when economists work with accountants. Right. It becomes uh, a relationship where they try inventing some new terms. So, twin balance sheet means that a balance sheet has two things: assets and what? Any balance sheet of a company has assets and liabilities. Right? I have assets that I can earn money from and I have liabilities that I have to pay. We are facing a situation right now that assets are not giving us money and our liabilities are all there. So I am you know, trapped from both ends. I don't have any assets. So that's a twin balance sheet problem. Twin balance sheet usually is seen as high bank debt and low credit growth. For me, for the bank, loans are an asset. Right and deposits that people make are a liability. So we are facing that as a situation right now. That's a twin balance sheet problem. Yeah. Uh, we move. Yeah. We move now to to the third problem, and I think this is this is important from the perspective of at least the political economy of India. Elections right now, and all election discussions is around somewhere about this that the current government maybe has not done really well in creating growth that could increase jobs and that's the, the, the opposition's argument. Actually if you look at data, this is the data which I had shown you earlier that most, still 50% people are working in agriculture so there's not a huge structural shift that has happened. But what has really happened to employment I think is depicted by these two charts. I think it's very important to see it because I'm comparing it here with at least this number with China and India. Between 2000 and 2017, China from having more than 60% of people, between the age of 15 and 24, more than 60% of the people had a job which they were getting as an employment. That number has come down in China as well to, to, to less than 50, but in India that number is around 30% now. So people between the age of the working age population group, only 30% of them have job in the formal organized employment base. Rest are all working out from the formal base. Um, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. That's one of the years and I think if you, no, but this is compatible with if you make from 15 to 45. If you take the age from 15 to 30 or even as well, uh, it's more or less the same. It's not drastically different. What it means is even if I get my education and I'm 21 or 22, uh, only 30% of the people coming out. It's very true of this university as well. I can, I can attest to that. People seeking active employment and formal opportunities in spite of coming with a very high income group, if they don't tap into their existing network right, to get a job, just in terms of looking at the market, less than 30% would be able to get a job from the market, right? Just using their skills. Uh, mostly people would have to go back, call this person, call an uncle, call an aunt, or just say that, okay, I'm looking out for him. But those are existing networks, which I think Vajad was yesterday talking about, that Ambani could become Ambani because he was coming from a community of that kind. Yeah. Yeah, that's a question which has been asked right now. It's, it's, that's, that's a question out there in the debate that you are growing, maybe it's growing at 6-7%, but whatever growth is happening, it's happening at a level that your labor or workforce is not getting employed. That's it, the term which is used is jobless growth. It is possible, but it's, it's, it, it, the question is what is the country doing about it? I would say not much because right now, the current government, for example, is not very acknowledging of this aspect that we have an unemployment problem. You can only address a problem when you acknowledge that you have one. Uh, 
pretty typical to photo after 1.3 billion uh, people. <laughs> uh, you are a uh, growing for nuts, so maybe it's not really true. I, I would say I'm sure that the other like 40 percent they, they earning money from something. No, no, no. So I think that there we have to we have to isolate this. I'm not saying that you don't have a job per se. 30% as I said is have able to get a job in a formal organized with social protection. I can I can get out with my degree and sell vegetables in the in the market and I would say that I have a job, right? Because I'm getting money to be able to pay in finance for services. But based on what I'm seeking out, which is that I have a degree in economics, well I what do I have a job in a bank? Do I have a job in a consultancy? Do I have a job anywhere outside? That's formal organized employment. Yes. So if you look at total employment levels in India, out of 100 people employed, 80 are working in the unorganized sector. 20 are working in the formal organized sector. Now out of these 20 people working, the idea is to increase more and more people in the formal organized, government jobs, private sector jobs, most of them. <laughs> Sorry? The, it's from the age of 15 to 40. Yeah, 15 so to 40. Is the age of 15 to 40 work in India? Oh, no, no. <laughs> when you calculate the population ratio, you always do it between uh, the working age population category. In the world, World Bank calculates 15 to 45. Then okay. they break into 15 to 4, 24. Some countries, 15, after 15, you can start working. You know, in the US, for example, when you're working in the undergraduate level, you're allowed to work in the library, right? right? You're getting an income from there. In, technically, you do have a bank account. You do start working as a graduate assistant or a teaching assistant. So you started working right there. So that's something which is a constraint. I'll break this down. I think a lot of discussion around employment happens. I think what, what you're pointing out is a very important point. I think it's, it's helped explain by this category. It's not about the fact that you don't have jobs because people are working and doing something to survive, right? The problem is that most working are working in a category which is like, for example, the World Bank calls is a vulnerable employment category. Like what? When you see how construction activity is happening on campus, you should see where the construction workers stay, in what conditions are they working, do they have adequate protection in terms of their where are they staying, right? It's, it's labor which is moving all across the country with entire families and the migrant workers, right? And this is not a phenomenon which is very unique to India alone. You can take the case of Brazil, you can take the case of China, you can take the case of most countries which have large labor surplus bases. It's definitely not a big issue from what I could see back in Israel because it's not a huge base of people coming in all the time. You control, you're cutting down on migration all the time, right? It's restricting of that. But in the Indian context, interstate migration is free. I can get out from here, go to Bombay, and I can start working. Every month, almost 30 to 50,000 people are arriving from trains from other cities in search of jobs. So they are doing something, and that's why you see a lot of slums. When you go from here to Delhi, you'll find on your route, a lot. I think you must have seen it while coming in, right? A lot of slum areas and habitants. So they're all working in vulnerable category. Criticism has been that, see, China had a similar problem in 2000. 50% of its total employment was in vulnerable category. It's brought the level down to around 30 now. It still is a problem there. Migration labor in China also lives under very terrible conditions. You don't get the news out of it because it's very difficult to get to record. In India, it was 80%, it's still around 75 to 80. So imagine 80 people working out of 100 in without social protection, no insurance, um, no support for family, and not even housing as a, as a requirement. So that's a, that's a constraint, that the quality of jobs per se is, is a constraint which is there. And people are doing those things. Now, what about unemployment last two, two in the six, seven years? The current government has been criticized, I think, primarily on this part, that not only you have not acknowledged the existing problem 
of vulnerable employment, you have ultimately driven people out of unemployment as well. Now this happened as a result of two reforms. I don't want to get into it right now. But why this sudden spike? You must be seeing this sudden spike. That happened as a result of two measures. One was of demonetization where they eliminated uh, uh, two currency notes from the economy. That's 500 and yeah. 1,000, yeah. This was, yeah, three years, three years ago, no? Three years ago, Demonetization, one of the main things to understand is that again, go back to the construction worker on campus, all right? Because that, see, I'm, I'm just trying to bring an imagery which you've seen all, all the time. Th that individual is getting paid every day on a daily wage or at a monthly level in cash most of the time, not money transferred in the account and then you can go and ATM. Most of them are being paid that way. The gardeners, for example, on campus, they're being paid from a. So when you hit on cash, 80% of our money supply was in 500 and 1000 rupee notes. So if you say from tomorrow these two notes are no longer valuable, right? What happens? You, there's a sudden cash crisis and crunch. Uh, everybody does not have a debit card or a credit card that you can keep doing transactions. So the worst affected areas were agriculture, A. The second was construction activities and unorganized employment. So those who were working as a part of this 80 or 70 group, they suffered immensely, right? Uh, and the other was the tax reform of GST, it's the goods and services tax. All businesses were asked to, to move up to a unified tax system, which is done. Like you have a VAT, value added tax, back in, back in Israel. We had a VAT system, but we moved towards one single tax, that's the GST. For that, every trader was given a notice of I think less than a few weeks to have an account. Otherwise, it's his or her business would no longer be legit. Mm -hmm. And that pushed, sorry. Yeah, please, please, please. You know what I'm saying? You should call a very good question. I think it's it's one of the questions which is central to economic planning that you do not undertake monetary reform which affects your social indicators. Employment being one which is so important for production, everything. And that's why the question came. RBI governor that time had said no. 
So internally, there was no consensus on this. It was done very ad hoc. It was, in fact, one or two people who would have decided this. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you just an honest kind of picture. Employment? Well, if, if it's like this, if I'm paying you money in cash and I don't have cash, it's like you, you got two, two of you guys needed to go to the ATM, right? And you went to the ATM and let's say ATM had no money for the next one month. So where are you going to get your cash? You're going to go to the bank. Everyone queues up to the bank. Bank says, listen, we can only give you today uh, 1,000 rupees because we have so many people. And it's only, again, that's, see, that's why I said yesterday, it's a very emotional land. One, any other country had faced this, there would have been riots, violence, and, and massive killing. I mean, just contemplate the fact uh, that it wasn't in the US. In the US, when they had the financial crisis 2007 and 8, even the, con the fear that I can go and not get my money from the bank was pushing people off, right? Here, it was just that, okay, well, we have to patiently wait. Let's see that, and you could just see, just try demonetization on Google and see images. The queues were immense and long. Most of us were in the, in the queues. So the relation is very simple. If I don't have cash, I can't pay my workers. If I can't pay my workers, I'll get them out. So the, see, the reason why I mentioned that, I would have avoided talking about it, but a lot of times these questions come, why this unemployment level is suddenly shot up, right? And it happened, of course, as a trigger. Uh, what, nobody expected it. Of course, nobody would have thought that this is where the impact will go. The other thing is on wages, and I think that anybody wants to study in the world today. Uh, this is a global phenomenon. Wages generally are coming down because those in manufacturing, I mean, most of you guys, if you are now thinking of a business, first thing you'll think of is a website. You need to have this. So you'll think of way less people. You'll think largely of using your existing technological networks to maximize you know, the setup and then have uh, people brought in. So what that has done is a move towards capital intensive methods of production has worked well where capital is in surplus and labor is low. So Japan, good. Israel, great. Right? India, not so good. China, well, it's trying to balance it. That's why you'd see Chinese investment in other countries as a part of an infrastructural plan uh, means that a Chinese company will invest, but it will also get a wave of 50 or 60 people or 100 people as construction workers. That's why a lot of countries like Mauritius, Ch uh, Pakistan, Cambodia, a lot of them, they were complaining. They said, see, we want your investment, but we don't want so many people. But the idea is that the Chinese state's contract with its citizens is, we give you employment. You don't ask for civic freedoms, but we'll give you employment and higher income. That's the contract that they've established. And if they breach the contract and wages start falling, it's going to result in a higher revolutionary kind of activity. So in India right now, you're seeing this as well, that wages are generally falling. Uh, rural wages have been worst affected, that is wages of farmers and incomes. That's why you said that the performance of agriculture was doing well. I'll quickly move to gender as a subject of discussion because this is important. To be honest, women have suffered more from this because the women participation in unorganized, vulnerable categories is the highest, right? Uh, so it's, this is important because you look at paid work and you look at unpaid work for women. Work happening in, because it's a very patriarchal system, not every way patriarchy operates, but it all operates in a certain way. What would be the word for patriarchy? Uh, pa patriarchy? Patriarch? Patriarch? Yeah, okay, so that's, it's clear, right? More than patriarchy is a heavy. So you see that you see that happening that uh, at the end of even 2011 we had less than 20% uh, women working in the non-agricultural sector. All right, this is inclusive. So if there are if there are 100 women with job, less than 20 are working outside agriculture. That means most are working in agriculture. Now, what kind of work you're doing in agriculture, that's for you guys to see. 
and observe, but it's a lot of work. Uh, um, it, at the same time, what it is doing is, is throwing a lot of questions on sector-wise employment of women. I thought this is a chart which you must take with you, just in your memory, is to look at which sectors have what kind of gender balance in terms of employment. You look at health and education, these are the two sectors with most gender balanced employment levels. What about IT? You don't see that much. Now you tell me yourself, which sectors in India have done tremendously well after the 1990s? Is it IT? Yes. Is it trade? Okay, yes. Construction? Yes. All these sectors, accommodation and restaurant? Yes. I mean, of course, these businesses have done well. All of these have a high gender imbalance. So what it means is the sectors you have had policies to do really well, they have not have been able to get more women as a part of their formal employment opportunity. But health and education have had that. But they are also in India, and that's where I said that social opportunities in India is a big problem. The state has funded least in health and education. In fact, defense is one of the highest. But health and education, the state has invested these. It's mostly private sector. Even the health center on campus, it's not a government facility. It's a private company. Mostly in Delhi, you find it's all private hospitals. What it does is that overall employment is gender balanced. But for people getting access to health and education, it's a, it's a constraint. So this is a very important chart. Now, you may want to say that is it an Indian problem generally, or is it something which is happening in South Asia otherwise as well? So this is just on the right side of the chart, which gives you a comparative example of India with other countries in South Asia. Not included China here, but only countries in South Asia. Now, you need to tell me which country is doing relatively uh, better and relatively worse off with India on gender balance. So the, the data tells you percentage of people more than 15 and older, right? 15 and over working uh, males and working females. So the orange bar is males, uh, blue is. So two countries. Yeah, that's why that's why I said just just mentioned it. Male, it's 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 orange. Um, uh, blue is is women. So now tell me which two countries are not doing uh, doing worse off to India in gender balance? Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Okay. Now, which are doing which are doing really uh, better? Myanmar, Bhutan, Nepal. Now, one country which was doing worse off than India, I think was it yeah eight to ten years back, eight to ten years back, but now is ahead of India in this department is Bangladesh because they have consciously spent on 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 trying to improve gender participation. And that's affected their economic performance as well. I mean, it's allowed them to really pick up. Because, you know, it's not as if that you're talking about women as the other. In India, population of women is more than men. Yeah. So it's, it's like how much of process of inclusion is a part of that. I think it's a very important thing. Except Bangladesh. That's why I was just about to say that. I mean, religion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, religion plays an important factor, of course. But I mean, Bangladesh is one of the countries which has balanced out its its belief systems with its economic performance. And Afghanistan has gone through a lot in terms of internal uh, conflict, and I think a number of those things. But that's there. And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, these are charts you can see later. I don't want to kind of give you the things. Now let me go on the ears because I have just around 5 to 10 minutes and let me just kind of not take much time on this. Now you've seen the macro picture. This is, I've given you the kind of the bird's eye view so far. Let's go a bit on the field to get you a little bit of an idea. This is a part of a study <coughs> we've been doing over the last three years on local markets in Delhi, Calcutta, uh, Phnom Penh in Cambodia, Siem Reap in Cambodia. So, We've been trying to understand who are the people coming in the markets to work. Most of these markets are local street side markets. And uh, we usually call them the floating invisible. 
entrepreneurs because from the data they're all missing right and that's something which is usually a constraint this is a market in delhi i i, I think you guys have two days in delhi where you have a conference right and this is accessible a, a area in south delhi i would kindly request the instructors please to take some time this is a tourist market actually so it's very safe and, and very accessible it's a market called delhi hut hut is a term for market as a as a aggregation and this is a, a market which is set up by the government to provide every state an opportunity to feature its crafts so for the question earlier that what manufacturing has you can go here and see textile shawls everything from here pashmina people everything here so <laughs> delhi delhi hard is interesting but very few people actually talk about the life of 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 vendors or merchants who are selling stuff so we made an effort to talk the person on the right in the chart you see is the with the with the, with the green shirt uh, is shabi uh and there's there's a very interesting story of how he's managed to come in he's a resident of kashmir uh in in the north is a shawl vendor but sells other woolen items his business is a family owned business was started by his grandfather sets a shop in delhi hart but please note they're only given a time of 15 days to to so they set up a shop in 15 days they have to sell everything and go back so the idea is that's why on the if you go on the 14th or the 15th day of the market you'll be able to bargain is the most because they have to clear the stock and move to another city so this guy moves to around i think from what i remember six to seven cities in india is a floating entrepreneur buys just gets a place to stay for a short period of time and goes back to kashmir he sources most of his raw materials from kashmir and has employed karigars karigars is the word uh, in hindustani for craftsmen right or those people who work uh in in getting the the, the shawls ready uh to embroider the cloth uh his business is based on a self manufacturing mode and there's always room for negotiation and there's a certain costing idea so to give you a sense and i think this is important shabir would be seen as a part of the unorganized employment segment because he is a he's an entrepreneur but he's not received much social support from the state to be honest you know all he's got is a, is a, is a, is a location where he can come in for 15 days and that is also through a lottery system you know everyone has to be extremely lucky to get a chance to come in uh, the place so what he does is primarily uh, he is a representative of the average indian entrepreneur right uh, and that's 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 important to see this is how business uh, landscape in india is there this is another market now you can barely find um it's a street side market that means it is set up on one day of the week it's usually a wednesday so if you go on a wednesday to some places or on a sunday in delhi there there are street side markets traffic is all gone everything you have to just walk so it's all over hey what is that place uh, shuk shukka kamal yes, shukka kamal shukka kamal right so i went uh, uh, there it's very similar to that but shukka kamal is much more organized now right yeah. very organized right this is yeah this is you can you will be walking this way you can end up walking that way just with the crowd coming in so these are people who are navigating themselves all around coming in and selling so from this image you can find from tv remotes to i don't know to to i don't know cosmetics to almost everything possible that this guy would be able to sell you this kind of market is it the atm connected or if they call something oh, that's that's a big question legality they are allowed to have an arrangement with the local traffic and police systems to get some kind of safety net to to do the trade but if we talk about legality in terms of having land or access to be legit um that's not true in some case it depends from market to market so let's say this one in delhi hart you find they pay rent yes and they pay a fees and they can stay for 15 days and sell that's a much organized market system here there is nothing like that you so just there are other places around the world that they have like you use dark matter to check people for the thing yeah uh, uh, i i get what you mean yeah i don't know what the shit yeah like you see yeah. them when the police are coming or there oh, like, so they put everything and they run away yeah 
That's Canada. exactly, that's, that's what you'll see in Connaught Place, the market you're going tomorrow. Okay. So all you have to observe is when you go into that market, there are shops there, and there's a parallel market outside the shop. So when the, there is someone who senses that the people are coming, yeah. <laughs> some. So some people, that, no, no, so a lot of people what they've done is they've collectively unionized a lot of people who sell the product and they say, listen, we're going to give you a little bit of fees. Uh, now a lot of people would see that as corruption or bribe. Well, the idea is they give, this is a protect, we call it protection yeah. fee. It's a protection fee and we, uh, let us do our business for these hours and we'll go. Uh, but most of these people are different. Now this is Old Delhi. This is Old Delhi. Old Delhi is, uh, uh, I don't know if you're planning a visit, I mean, uh, if, if, if you can think at, this is uh, near Jama Masjid, which is one of the kind of oldest and biggest mosques. Yes, Red Fort. Yeah. So these are some of the most ancient markets. I think the, the only resemblance you can think of is when you go to places like Turkey and Istanbul. You know, the markets where, where Istanbul was a center for attracting a lot of traders. This was, Delhi was known for its markets because of old Delhi. So I mentioned like say three. Uh, in from, within a one kilometer uh, circumference, we could track around 34 uh, indigenous markets from brass to jewelry to, to, to uh, metals <coughs> to apparel to clothes, anything, right? And this is huge and massive. Here the state has tried to do some kind of a system where they have given some licenses, but 80% of the trade which is happening is happening outside the, the space. That's why the image, this is one of the most least traffic hours uh, that you can get this image. <laughs> now let's, let's quickly go to this woman in Calcutta. This is a work we did in a, a market in Calcutta. Her name is Sahana Bibi. Uh, she works as a flower vendor. And uh, her, 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 I'm sorry, you're noticing. Like <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, yes, 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 this is called. Now, just look at the position where she's standing, and that's, that's a market space, that's a shop. In a way, that's the only space she has to navigate away. It's, it's pretty unsafe as well, at the same time, the number of challenges. She's been there for the last good 20, 25 years has had a uh, number of people and you know what you just see what is she's holding in her hand tell me phone no no I, I don't have, it's a phone yeah it's a phone it's a yeah. smartphone yeah and you know our conversation with her was a very different conversation I mean, she is very technologically aware of the potential to which she can expand her, her flower business she, because she knows that at what hours what kind of demand for flowers comes in so she's like, my only hope is if the state helps me or anyone, the private union you know, or whatever, help me train a little bit to set up a small shop, or if not that, let me have, uh, an, uh, I mean, and the word she used was, uh, uh, was a reference to an app system or something where through phones, because she's already doing and managing a lot of her business through calls, so her loyal clientele would give her a call, I need this much, this much at this hour, so she'll get that and get her business. But her problem is primarily of scaling. She's had a limited basket of people who come to get stuff for her, and that's restricted only to that. I think five. Yeah. Uh, so it's very interesting because she, her point is that if we can use technology to scale our business, this is helpful for two reasons. One is giving us a certain degree of respect for our vocation and product. This is one of the largest flower markets in Asia. Uh, this is Mulik Ghat. Uh, Mulik Ghat is, is right next to the Huli River and very close to the temple. So what you would see is that her explanation is of two kinds. One is it's good for my business. The second, as a woman, it's difficult for me doing business. Yeah, is she alone? So, no, 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 there's a number of women traders. I mean, I can give you. No, is she alone? Oh yeah, alone as man. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's doing yeah, it by herself. Yeah, someone. She is she afraid someone to steal from her? No, or no, no. It's okay for it's her to be alone. So in at least in her case, the intimidation was more of people out around her. They were more intimidated by her than, than the other way around. But having said that, I think she generally feels that the agency of women 
is is weak condition to the fact that they are doing business in a very small group okay. if scaling happens and a greater financial independence can come in it can give you the the opportunity so she is is talking more in terms of a representative core of a number of flower traders there who are women now let me tell you uh, this is out a time when i could take man is taking a photograph but if you see the the look of the market from one side there are almost seven to eight sides which are different parts this is how the market looks on type you see uh, on top uh, uh, there's a railway track on the left there's slums uh, and the market is set up right in the middle so that's the only walking path you have which is which is the space this is how it looks like the the, the third way of looking at it the peak hours this is what the market is so it is it is in this place you have to do your entire trade and activity and business and yes i mean it's it's a space which is there but that's your average indian entrepreneur in the unorganized uh, segment right in every city it has its own i think calcutta there as a city has done but far better men. sorry they yeah they mostly men right so no but there are different stretches so you'll find uh, at certain points there are most of the traders that this one part where i went were mostly men there were certain parts where there were men men and women i mean it's a huge massive market yeah. uh so so that's one um i i i mean this is the final story i had of this this guy oshik he is a uh, he's a sculptor in one of the markets in calcutta uh, and and he's been doing sculpting for the last uh, i think 24 to 25 years uh his own experience is there but he learned it from his father it's a family a business and he has a shop but see for him he takes orders and sculpts statues and a lot of durga idols in the time when there is durga puja um that's that's a festival which is really big back in calcutta so his own work he feels is undervalued not only financially but because he doesn't have access to a larger market right and again i mean both in the case of oishik and sana you would find that both mention i mean documented in studies after studies they understand what technology can do but with little bit of support and navigation they can expand on the scaling side i think that's the fundamental problem we facing uh, i'll stop right there because there are always things to look at uh, issues around nourishment and more of those but you'll have these slides with you so for those who are interested you can just look at the data i'll stop there thank you ah uh, yeah i i i have i'm trying to work out a couple of things but uh, i am meeting the students who are going to be with you so i can i'll tell you a couple of spots see i usually say when the first time you going yourself i've talked about the market generally uh, instead of me my eyes telling you what to see your own eyes should should, yeah. should do that yeah oh okay all right all right i will i will i will help the volunteers whoever is visiting or whoever is visiting uh to just tell a couple of spots where you guys go but cannot place is a it's a round market so wherever you going you will see the parallel markets outside one place you have to go and you can write it is palika bazaar i think that's one place you have to go it's a it was a it's 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 a we'll see this uh, i think Double L I K. I'm writing. I'm writing it down here. Just, just wait a second. You know, just I'm trying to. Also, the T-shirt right outside the room. 